Okay, so we are now live on air, and we are very excited to have Kelly Wrighton doing a talk today for the Baker Seminar Series. Kelly uh, did her PhD with John Coates at UC Berkeley and stayed at Berkeley because no one wants to leave Southern California, right? Um, and worked with Jill Banfield and has been publishing every genome ever since then. Um, and uh, she's going to talk to us today about a project she's been doing since she started a faculty position at The Ohio State and uh, is working on tracking fracking and thinking about how fracking fluids interact with the subsurface. So with that, I will let Kelly take it away if you want to share slides, Kelly. Now that you've trained me, I'm a pro. <laughs> and um, just remind everyone, if you want to ask a question, you can type it in the Google chat window, or you can tweet it to MicroSeminar, or use the hashtag useminar. And um, just to let you know, I'm the only one. Cameron's sick today, so I'm the only one reading this feed, so please be patient. All right, so Kelly will share slides. Yes, have I done that? You need to share screen and then hit um, the... Uh, so good the first time when we practiced. Now look at me. I'm just falling <laughs> apart. Um, okay, sharing. And then I go... Yeah? Is that better, Biddle? And now... Right, now just, yeah, now just view slides and we should be good. And I'm going to shut off my, my microphone and video camera. And I'm going to sit here in my office and imagine that you're all here so I don't feel crazy for talking to myself for the next 30 minutes. All right, go for it. OK. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, the title of my talk is Tracking Fracking. Um, and the punchline, for a little spoiler, is what goes down mainly comes up. Vague enough that we can still have lots to talk about in the next 30 or so minutes. So a lot of my work, probably actually through my career, has kind of been related to biogeochemical cycling, um, and with particular focus on the deep terrestrial subsurface. Um, as microbiologists, we're interested in these systems. Um, it's a frontier in microbial ecology, um, especially the terrestrial subsurface. Uh, there's plenty of biomass, we think, in the system, especially in certain environments. Um, and it really remains poorly characterized. And so I just wanted to kind of showcase a, a stratigraphy of the subsurface so that we have a sense of where we're talking about. So today, we're going to be focusing on the sedimentary rock layer, so we're actually moving below the freshwater aquifers and the water tables below the soil, so below the root zone, below the soil layer, below the freshwater aquifers, and down into the sedimentary rock. Here you can see that's highlighted in, in a pale green. So what happens and what, to these habitats as we move deeper into the terrestrial subsurface? And so you can imagine in the, in kind of the aquifer layer, we have a, a broad pore network. We have lots of nutrient accessibility um, and genetic exchange happening in the ecosystem. As we move deeper into sedimentary rock, though, the system becomes, we experience higher temperatures and pressures, and we'll talk more about that um, in a few slides. But we also, life becomes confined to these pore networks, these pore structures, uh, or these fractures. And so really the question is, is, is what, what, ha what does life look like in this deep subsurface? And how does energy extraction impact the biogeochemistry of these systems? So I'm going to be focusing today on my work that I started when I landed here at Ohio State last fall. And we're looking at microbial ecology of the shale system. And we're really going to be focusing on the Marcellus shale, which is over here on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, but you can see that these shale plays are you know, broadly distributed across the United States and North America. Beyond being a novel ecosystem and the potential for looking at new organisms or new insight into microbial metabolisms, shale is also, as we all know, an economically important resource. Um, and so in the Marcellus is especially so. And so you can see the Marcellus um, shale area spans Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and dips a little bit into Ohio. Um, and it's estimated that there's 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in this rock. We call it an unconventional reservoir because this means that actually to access the gas trapped in the pore structures of this rock we have to stimulate um, through hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. And so you can see here on the right-hand side of this graph the shale production in the U.S. And so really shale production in our region, um, in Ohio and West Virginia, really kicked off in around 2010. And you can see the projections are that it's going to account for about 30% of the nat natural gas usage in the United States. 
So what does shale look like as a microbial habitat? Um, and I think you know, part of this research today is going to be focused on what happens after energy extraction. Um, but some of our research through an NSF uh, funded research project is actually looking at life in pristine shales as well. So before, we can imagine, here are some actually images. This one's from Dave Cole, the one on the right. And it's actually a cross section of a scan through shale. Um, and you can see from these that it's basically low porosity. And we might have some natural fissures. Um, and that's where we believe if there is native microbial life, it's confined to. The depths that I'm going to be talking about, the samples coming from, are about 2,500 meters below the surface. The pressure is about 50 megapascals. The temperatures, what would be considered thermophilic at around 60 C. Um, the salinity is quite high. And that's because these shales were formerly um, deposited as marine systems. And then what the real clincher in the system for microbial life um, is the pore throats. And so the, basically the openings to these fissures or these pore networks is very, very small. And so that may inhibit energy um, in the form of nutrients or as well as genetic exchange in these systems. Um, and they're obviously very high carbon content. And the shale binds a lot of metals, some of which are radioactive. OK, so you can imagine, like the microbes, the gas is actually confined in these pore networks as well. And so as I mentioned, and I think we're all fairly familiar with, in order to access these gas res reservoirs, we drill into the system. And so we vertically drill first. And we basically, that's what you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen. And we drill down about 2,500 meters. And then we kind of kick out and do a 90 degree turn and do horizontal drilling. And then from this horizontal drilling, once this, once this is in place, we actually hydraulically fracture the system. Um, and so that's in the injection of about of li liters of water and propens in the form of sand and as well as chemicals. And the idea is, is that basically fractures the shale and releases the gas, connecting the basically the subsurface to the surface where the gas can be recovered. And so when we think back now to the habitat after fracturing, we have to account for some factors that are, that are changing or disrupting the system. And the first source is the source material in, in the form of injected compounds. And so like I said, we're injecting about 15 to 25 million liters of fluid. That fluid contains a high amount of organic material. Much of it is in the form of biocides and other chemicals to inhibit microbial growth. And we'll talk about how maybe that may not be so effective later on. Uh, we also inject a lot of sand, and that sand functions as a propent. So once the fractures are in place, the sand keeps those fractures in place so that gas can continue to come out of the system. About 80% of the fluid remains in the system, and we basically recover 20 to 30% of the surface. In addition, this input material, depending on where the source material is from, whether it's a freshwater lake or another system, can have a, a variety of electron acceptors that we're also dumping into the system. And so you can see by the, the illustration in the upper hand corner what I, what I kind of project is happening in these systems. So now we are adding more labile carbon to the system. We're adding potentially organisms to the system. And we're actually adding electron acceptors to the system. In the same time, we're also freeing up and creating reactive services um, for biogeochemical reactions to occur. All right. So why do we care about microbial metabolism after fracking? And this is actually a conversation I just had with my dad last week. Um, this has vital economical and environmental ramifications. One such re uh, area that we should be concerned about, which really hasn't been a focus in the natural gas in industry yet, is corrosion. And especially in this system, because we're, what we're really concerned with is contamination of the surface aquifers. And that's the region that I highlighted here in this figure in, in red. Um, and so microbial metabolism, here's some actual steel cartridges that were deposited um, in, hail, in a shale system in Texas, um, can become corroded and vulnerable to leaking. Also, microbial metabolism can impact energy yields, both good and bad. Um, and so we can have basically souring of the well. We can have microbial biomass um, clogging, the well, clogging the fractures. And on the, on the positive side, we could also have an enhanced hydrocarbon recovery from the system through the stimulation of CO2, or potentially, which I'll be talking about later today, biogenic methane production. Um, a colleague of mine, Paula Mauser, is looking at the biodegradation of chemicals in the waste stream. So this could have important ramifications for the long-term use of water in these systems. And an area that we're really excited about, um, which is really taking off next year in our research portfolio, is the ability to access potentially 
organisms that have been encased in shales um, and trapped in these systems at their deposition. Okay, but today we're talking about fracking. So the title of my talk is Tracking Fracking Microbial Communities. Um, and so we're going to be looking at three sites. And today, in all of these sites, for those of you who are tuning in from the West Coast and may not know where Columbus, Ohio is, I've uh, incorporated some landmarks like Lake Erie um, to guide you. So here we are in Columbus. The red circle is my home. And you can see that these field sites are actually very close to my backyard. Uh, the first field site I'm going to be talking about is a 328-day trajectory of input materials as well as output fluids that was collected during energy extraction in the Marcellus region in Pennsylvania. More recently, we've started working closer to home in a different shale, the Utica shale. Um, and here I have some recent data that I'm going to be showing you how we use the microbial metabolism um, and hypotheses that we generated from one to guide some cultivation efforts in number two. And number three is a collaboration that we have where we're looking at pristine shale in the Marcellus region at West Virginia. So I'm going to be talking about the Marcellus shell and the Utica shell. So what does that mean to you? Well, here you can see a cross-section of Ohio on the left and Pennsylvania on the right. Um, the Marcellus shell from Pennsylvania is, about, is, is around 2,500 or so feet, or meters, excuse me. Um, and its companion shale that we're looking at at Ohio is the Utica shale. And so the Utica shale technically is much older shale than the Marcellus. Um, and you can see the ages on the left-hand side of the screen. All right, so let's talk about some of the key terminology that I'll be using today. So when I talk about fracking fluid, I'm actually talking about the input fluids that go into the borehole. And the picture that you see here is actually from the Marcellus shale. Um, so what happens is basically fresh water is taken from a freshwater lake. It's pumped into these containers, where then it's blended, meaning that we add the sand and all the chemicals to it, and then it's injected down well. Once we pump out the, the fluid from the system, then we collect what's called either flowback fluids or production fluids. Flowback fluids are the fluids that immediately come to the surface about 14 days after the energy extraction has started. And the signature of the flowback fluids looks much like the signature of the input fluid um, in terms of its geochemistry. The production fluids, on the other hand, come out later in time, and they start taking on a chemical signature that looks more like the formation fluid. So it becomes a mixture of this input material as well as the native formation brine in the system. Um, and so here's actually a wellhead where the samples are collected, the flow back and production fluids, the types of samples. And here's a close-up just so you can see what we're kind of extracting from. Um, and so we have this kind of oil, these precipitates. These actually have been quite challenging systems to work in um, because we have basically every, everything that would kill a DNA extraction is in this little tube. Uh, we have hydrocarbons, we have lots of iron, we have very, very high salts. Um, and so I, I was surprised at how challenging of a system this has been for us to develop methods in. OK, so the flow for today's talk, I'm going to be starting off with some work done by my colleague, Paula Mauser, that started prior to me coming to the project. Um, and she did some 16S gene surveys from multiple wells in the Marcellus region. Um, and then from those time points, we selected from one well and reconstructed genomes using Illumina HiSeq um, from a selected, basically, temporal series. And so we use this genomics data to create hypotheses about microbial metabolism. Um, and then I, we ground truth that. And so the ground truthing happens via metabolomics or physiolo physiological confirmations through cultivation um, and more in-depth studies of physiology. And so the flow for today, I'm going to be kind of interchanging between methods and talking about results from different bits and pieces. And so if you look at the corner, I've tried to kind of tell you what kind of tool is being used um, to provide the data. And so hopefully this can be used to anchor us as we talk through the slides. All right. So when I, before I started on the project, um, Paula had done some work. And as I said, she looked at three wells. And so and what she was looking at is how the microbial community changed from the input material through the initial flow back into the later produced. Um, and what becomes clear from Paula's NMDS here, um, when you look at the input material, which is the small oval at 0.5 on the X scale, negative 0.5 on the X scale, uh, you can see both wells here. There's a light blue and a dark blue well with the number 0 next to them. They have a very different signature um, than the later initial flowbacks at days 7 and 13, which are more positive on the Y axis. 
And those are statistically different, those input and initial flowback communities, from those that we see in the later produced systems. And so when we look at what chemical factors drive the change in the microbial community over time, what you can see is that it's, it's conductivity primarily, and it's based on an increase in salt concentration over time. And so the system is going from, you can imagine an aerobic or having oxidized terminal electron acceptors, an input material with plenty of available carbon, um, and then down hole it goes to an initial flow back. There's still the presence of those, those basically terminal electron acceptors, and then it shifts in salinity drastically. And it's that shift in salinity that I think is really controlling a lot of the micro, microbial metabolism in the system. Um, note that these microbial community changes with time, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this talk, on this part because we'll get more into the meat of this later. Um, are not corresponding to a decrease in biomass. And so that really suggests that there is actually not just changes in relative abundance, but actually organisms growing in response to this environment. Um, and so these organisms are truly being enriched over time. And some of the key players from the 16S454 data that Paula collected are halotolerant organisms from Halanaerobium, Halomonas, and methanogens. And so we had a sense of who some of the microbial players were, but we had very little understanding when we started this project of what their kind of interconnected metabolic networks were and what, what sort of carbon was driving the system and what sort of outputs biogeochemically we could expect from the system. And so to get a better handle on that, we employed microbial genomics um, or metagenomics. And so we take the samples, same samples from the wellhead to the lab. We, this is actually the microbial biomass. You can see the high iron content. We extract the genomic DNA. We sequence it on a high seq. Um, and then the heart and soul of what we're doing is assembly-based metagenomics, um, and then we're reconstructing genomes, and we're using those genomic information to give us a sense of the microbial metabolism down well, um, and to generate more testable hypotheses that then we can follow up with other ground-truthing methods. So the first thing we do when we look at our genomics data after we do some QC is we run a merge, and what a merge gives us is a sense of the 16S genes that we can reconstruct from the system. And so consistent with what Paula saw in 4 by 4 we see a distinct community in the input material that shifts through the flow back, and then we basically see this fairly stable community that from August, which is time point 82 under production fluid, that stays fairly stable, at least at a genus level, um, until time point 328, which is around May. And so over this kind of 200-day sampling period, um, we see the enrichment of anaerobium in orange and members of the Halomonadaceae in blue. And we see that methanogens in the top two are some dominant members of the community in these later time points. And so I'll be talking about some of these samples throughout time, but what I'm really interested in is the stable-ish, stable let's use that technical term, um, community that forms and how consistent that community is across different shale systems. OK, I apologize for the horrendous colors on this one. Um, but what I'm trying to show you here is what becomes enriched over time and whether or not we could detect that in the input material. And so this is using the nearly full length 16S genes that we recovered from eMERGE. And essentially the question is, is yes, generally what we see at a um, 16S level appears to be present in the input material. Um, and so here we're looking at along the bottom on the x-axis, we're looking at Arcobacter, and time zero is denoted in gray. And it becomes really abundant um, in the early flowback fluids, and then actually crashes, and we don't see it at later time points. The middle three organisms, um, Marinobacter, Halanaerobium, and Halomonas, are our most dominant organisms at that later high salinity system. And you can see they constitute around 2% of the, or even less, of the input material. But they are present in that input material. So they aren't, we don't believe, at least with the data at hand right now, that they're native to the shale. Um, and then lastly is the methanogens. And so we have two methanogens, methanolobus and methanohalophilus. Um, methanohalophilus is enriched to about 2% in the later time points. Um, and it's not detectable in the earlier input material but I think this is just due to its low abundance in the system. And perhaps with deeper sequencing, we could better um, solve this. 
But the punchline here is that it looks like what we're enriching for in these ecosystems and the stable community that's forming is actually coming in on the input material. Um, and that was something we didn't know before starting this experiment. Okay, so how, how well, how tractable is this system? Uh, like all ecosystems, some genomes assemble better than others, and it's not always coordinated to how abundant you are. Uh, and so our methanogen, methanohalophilus, the later time point denoted in red, is nearly complete. Um, our acetaholobium is as well, and it turns out that that's more of an acetaholobium-like. It's actually a new genus in that family. Um, a halomonodaceae we do well. Notably, our halanaerobium, which are quite abundant members in our community, there's a lot of strain variation in these organisms, and we'll talk about maybe reasons why that strain variation is sustained over time. Um, but that is actually causing some problems for our genome uh, assembly, and we actually have some new data that suggests that we have kind of overcome some of these strain variation hurdles. So the members that I was most interested in starting with were some of the methanogens. Um, and so you can see that there's two methanogens that are recovered at day 82 and 328. And interestingly enough, that these methanogens show actually, uh, the methanolobus is actually has a, is kind of a moderate halophile, where the methanohalophilus can tolerate higher salts. And so we see, consistent with this salinity gradient that's forming over time, um, the change in these organisms' abundance patterns. So when I started this project, I hypothesized that the system would be driven by hydrogen a hydrogen-mediated methanogenesis. And that was based largely on a lot on thermodynamics, also my lack of knowledge about methanogenesis, and to be quite honest, and, um, and what had been demonstrated in other shale systems. What I found was that was actually not at all the case. In fact, we have no evidence for utilization of hydrogen nor the activation of acetate by these methanogens. And so these two methanogens actually have sequenced genomes that, with, that are um, have isolates that are characterized that are somewhat similar to the genomes we recovered, and this, this finding in our genomics is consistent with that. And so that these methanogens and the methanogen, the biogenic methane produced in this system is actually driven by trimethylamines or meth and methanol compounds. And so what you can see here is the genomic reconstruction for the two genomes. Uh, we have all genes for the pathway and the utilization of TMA, which is trimethylamine, dimethylamine, monomethylamine, as well as methanol and the methanohalophilus. And so that's going to be, become really important in terms of thinking about where those products are coming from in the system. And so the question that we are going to then seek to answer is, is there geochemical evidence for this metabolism, um, as well as what other biological um, feedbacks could exist to support this metabolism? But I wanted to throw this in here because when I started in methanogenesis, I didn't know much about methylamine methanogenesis myself. And it turns out when I went to the literature and did a little digging that most saline systems that are methanogenic are dominated by the methylamine-driven um, methanogenesis. And the reason for this is speculative, but it's based on thermodynamics. And so um, the, the delta G is very favorable for methylated substrates, and the energetic cost that it that methanogens have for living in high saline systems, basically in the, in the uh, creation of compatible solutes, is what is thought to be driven by this higher free energy. So we then, when we got this metagenomic data across these five time points, we were really interested and we saw the enrichment of this methylamine story. I wanted to see if there was any geochemical support for that. And so I collaborated with David Hoyt at PNNL um, via an EMSL grant and my student Dan Marcus, and what we did is we just did a quick and dirty where we sent in sample 328, and we just ran it on the NMR to see if we could actually detect monomethylamines or any methylamines, and right away we got a very clean signal um, in the original day 328 for monomethylamine. The structure is shown above. You can see it in the black box indicated on in the NMR. To confirm this was monomethylamine, David did two spikes of different concentrations, and you can see consistent with um, of methyl monomethylamine, MMA, and you can see consistent with those spikes an increase in the peak. Um, and so now where we are in this, this is data we just got back last week, is we're now running all the samples that we've had genomes for to kind of try to understand where the methylamines may be coming from in the system and how they may be degraded in the system to support biogenic methane over time in the system. So 
when we think about source of methylamines in the deep subsurface, we have to think we have two kind of possible scenarios. Scenario one is it's coming in on the input material. Scenario two is that it's produced or synthesized somehow in the shale system. So in considering scenario one, Dan Marcus, the graduate student on this project, um, went and dug through a bunch of EPA reports and um, other studies and found that there are sources of methylamines in these systems. And so choline, which is a compound that we become increasingly interested in, is actually added to fracture fluid um, in fairly high amounts, relatively speaking, um, to reduce qu clay swelling. Another methanol, which is also a substrate supporting methylamine-driven methanogenesis, is added in very high concentrations as a corrosion and scale inhibitor. Um, tetramethylammonium, tetramethylammonium, blah, 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 um, is also added to reduce clay swelling. Wow, this is a tongue twister of a slide. Um, anyhow, the point is, is that there are substrates coming into the system. And so what we're doing now is setting up different enrichment cultures to understand how these compounds can selectively um, charge an ecosystem under these saline conditions. The other source of methylamines in the system is that, that they could be synthesized in situ. And so where do methylenes come from? And so it turns out that organisms, when they adapt to high salt conditions, have two strategies for that adaptation, a salt in, um, which is basically they accumulate high intracellular potassium ions or other ions, and that's evidence that halanaerobium from isolate data uses that mechanism. The other strategy, which would fit into this kind of methylamine story quite nicely, is that organisms in these ecosystems synthesize or they use osmolites that are present in the system to stabilize their proteins. Um, and so there's suggestions in the literature that halomonas and methanohalophilus use both of these methods. And so you can see here glycine betaine. So then what I did is I went to the genomes and mined them for this basically this ability. So let's assume that choline is coming in as an input material. Um, and here you can see the structure. We looked for the genes. Um, and it turned out that Halomonas and Marinobacter, two of the dominant organisms in, these, in this terminal community after day 49 when the system becomes saline, actually can assimilate choline. They have all the necessary transporters and synthesize glycine betaine. And they use this as an osmoprotectant. In addition, these compounds, in addition to being used as an osmoprotectant, other organisms in this ecosystem can use this compound to drive energy metabolism. And so there's been a lot of work probably in the last two years on this and a lot of interest in this. Um, and so glycine betaine, or this osmoprotectant, can actually be fermented. And you can look at the structure. It's a nice carbon and nitrogen source, and especially in a system 300 days after fracking, which may be fairly limited in both of these compounds. Um, in terms of labile compounds, at least for nitrogen and carbon. And so what we see here when now overlaid in blue is the energy metabolism. And so a paper came out in 2012 suggesting that coal or demonstrating that choline could actually be used um, to, as a lyase, via a lyase, to form trimethylamine, which is a substrate for methanogenesis. Choline can also be used by methanogens directly. And so we're investigating and looking for those enzyme systems currently. We have some leads, but it's preliminary as of last night on the airplane, so I don't trust myself to report it today. Um, but of particular interest is this organism that we call acetohalobium because it's the nearest genome, but in fact it's a new genus within the Halobacteria rhodesiae. And this organism is a, a homoacetogen that essentially ferments glycine betaine and generates acetate, um, making TMA. Another organism in the system that we didn't have any evidence for but looks like it has all the necessary genes, is halanaerobium. And so these organisms both are obligate fermenters, and they're able to use these osmoprotectants to produce substrates like trimethylamine and dimethylamine that then can fuel methanogenesis in this ecosystem. So we have this nice kind of food web where we go from synthesis of osmoprotectants to energy metabolism to generate substrates uh, that support methanogenesis, biogenic methane in the system. Okay, so now thinking about this a little bit deeper, we, we kind of stumbled, okay, that all makes sense, but how are we going to go from an intracellular organic solute to supporting the metabolism of another organism? And so what is a mechanism for kind of getting those solutes out and accessible to other organisms? And so one thing that became really apparent when we started mining our genomes was the abundance of viruses in these fracturing fluid waters. And so 
for comparison, I've put the richness in terms of genome recovery um, on these temporal samples. So day 7, day 82, and day 328. And you can see there's about six bacterial and archaeal taxa on day 7, 7 and 82, and 6 again in 328. So really low richness systems. However, when we look at the viral genomes, we see there's an abundance of viruses that we can recover in these systems. And some of these viruses are very large in size, ranging, if you look on the y-axis, up to about 50 kb. And many of these viral genomes are, in fact, closed, as denoted by the circle. So this is just a sh an example of a closed viral genome. This is actually, its host is Halanaerobium, and we'll talk about that on the next slide, how we can kind of link viruses to their hosts. Um, but I wanted to kind of show you kind of our criteria for what constitutes a viral contig or a viral genome. Um, and so what, we're, what we have a requirement for is basically you must have some sort of viral structural machinery in your genome or on the contig. Um, you should ideally have a percent, large percentages of your proteins that are unknown or hit to other viruses and not to bacteria. All right. So the kind of holy grail for this hypothesis to be reasonable would be that we could actually link those viruses to the genomes and suggest that there is viral attack going on in the system that could be releasing um, these osmoprotectants, making it accessible to fuel this methylamine ecosystem. And so how do we do that? And so one mechanism for linking viruses to their host is the CRISPR-Cas system. And so some organisms, bacterial and archaeal organisms, use this as an immune system. And so anytime they encounter a virus in the system, they basically take a snapshot of that DNA and keep it in their genome. And so we mined this kind of, the organism's viral barcodes to see what kind of viruses they have encountered over time. And then we looked, we took that barcode and hit it to our viral database to then match and say, yes, we have recovered that virus. So we could actually say that that virus has interacted with that host at some point during its life history. And that's shown here in the diagram on the CRISPR-Cas system. So essentially what we're looking for is these unique spacers, which are the viral information that's encoded in the host system. So it just functions like an immune system like you or I would have. Okay, and when we do this, we actually, we were kind of blown away when we started putting together this network. This is very, very unusual that you have this kind of tight coupling via CRISPR linkages in a system. Um, in fact, we could find no other ecosystems that had anywhere near this amount of linkages. Um, there's been some work at Link Tyrol, which is another saline system by Jill Banfield's group, um, and that was a virome-directed study, and even in that system, it was a three-year study where they actually were going directly after the virome, they found probably around six to 12 linkages. So this is fairly exceptional that we found six, 56 viruses that we can link through their CRISPR system to 11 host genomes. Um, and what is especially interesting in this system is that we can actually link a virus to multiple strains or genotypes. Um, and so you can see this basically in the yellow sphere that is Halanaerobium, which is our dominant kind of organism over time. And I suggested that it had high strain, strain variation, which may be impacting our assembly. Um, well, you can see that here is that you, we have viruses um, denoted in dark black lines that can actually basically have interacted with both strains of Halanaerobium. And so what we're looking at when we look at this diagram is that the small ovals represent all our viruses. And you can see that they're color coded by time. So the pink are the later time points, and the purple are the later time points, and the lighter colors are the earlier time points. And then you can see which virus is linked to which hosts, and the hosts are in white. Um, and so we were really, really surprised um, and excited by this data. And so now we can imagine that it, an organism like Marinobacter, which we have evidence for, um, that can convert choline to glycine betaine, if that organism in the green sphere in the left-hand corner is actually potentially having some viral, being lysed by viruses, that could now make these solutes, these compatible solutes, available for energy metabolism in the ecosystem. I'd also like to suggest that perhaps this, this viral network is actually, in, in addition to driving um, maybe a methylamine-driven ecosystem may also be explain kind of the strain variation we see in time. And so I was very careful when we were talking about the input, what comes in on the input material, and what comes in on the output material. And while they're similar by 16S, so greater than about 98% over a near full-length 16S, 
the genomes themselves are quite different. And so we see different strains through time. And perhaps it's this um, dynamic virus host interaction that be, can be contributing to that strain variation we see. Uh, so that's all well and good, but I promised you a little bit of ground truthing. And so this work, a lot of this work's done by Mike Wilkins in the Earth Science Department at OSU and his lab manager. And so we use these genomics data to guide cultivation efforts. So we've now moved into the Utica system. We took what we knew about the system and said, can we isolate these genomes based on the metabolisms that we've inferred from our genomics data? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, despite different fracturing systems, despite different input material, despite different <laughs> well manufacturers and, and everything. I mean, every variable is essentially different, yet we see this convergence in terms of the organisms. And so what you're looking at here is the 16S abundance in our Marcellus, and that's denoted all of the Marcellus samples are emerge 11, 29, looking at the bottom of the tree. And you can see the relative abundance of those organisms. And then in red, you can see the isolates that we were able to pull out of this system. And so that acetahalobium-like organism that I referred to, um, and that halanaerobium, those two organisms that were actually fermenting the osmoprotectants and perhaps producing substrates for methanogens, we actually have in isolation. And so when we look at this halanaerobium in more detail, um, we see that it can grow in 80 grams per liter of salt, which is on the low end of actually what we see in Marcellus, and now we're testing higher, higher ranges. But when we do an NMR on the osmoprotectants within that organism, we see that there's about 100 micromolar of methyl-based substrates from methanol, methylamines, dye, dye, tri, and mono, as well as betaine. So this organism in itself also has them as, as osmoprotectants, but it can also potentially grow on them, and that's what we're actually testing right now. When we did this growth curve, we were really excited and surprised by the very short stationary phase. And so basically, you can see it's about a two hours or 10 hours, somewhere in there, and then we see a very fast crash. And what we were hoping would be the case was that perhaps um, there was some sort of nutrient limitation or some suggestion that these prophages um, that are in these genomes could be basically induced um, via stress. And so we actually added minomycin as well as non-induced. And then we actually filtered through 0.2 micron filter and concentrated that information or that, that <laughs> those samples and that biomass. And then we are submitting that for sequencing. Um, under the microscope right now, it looks like we have particles that are very, very small and could be putative viral-like particles. And we're submitting those to EMSL for some cryo-EM. Um, but we have every reason to believe that they are not how anaerobium cells, which are much larger and would be retained on the higher filter, um, and that they are these VLPs that are being induced during the growth phase, um, supporting our hypothesis in the system. So to summarize my deep thoughts, I never get a chance to be deep, so I'm going to take full advantage of this. Um, hydraulic fracturing, my argument here today would be hydraulic fracturing provides the physical space, the nutrients, and most of the organisms. There's some cases in terms of the methanogens where I can't rule that out completely that become enriched in the fluids during natural gas production. The input chemistry, whether we're putting in choline and methanol and these other labile carbons, despite all the biocides we're dumping into the system, and the adaptation to salinity are what's driving a methylamine food web that is ultimately resulting in biogenic methane production. Um, this system has really got me thinking about what is stable. Um, so by 16S at a genus level, we see a high stability in the system after 49 days when the geochemistry kind of becomes more saline. But when we look at these genomes, we actually don't see we only see one halanaerobium genome that's shared through time at the later time points. Um, and so there's this strain variation in the system that we have no evidence for eukaryotes in the system. We infer that the viruses are playing a key role in mediating the biogeochemical cycles and essentially driving this methylamine-driven ecosystem, and that they can also be contributing to the strain variation that we see over time. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators um, so this is actually supported by NSF, um, and so it's an NSF between engineering with Paula Mauser, uh, Earth Sciences with Mike Wilkins, and David Cole, also in Earth Sciences, um, and so at OSU, and then we also collaborate with Sheikha Sharma at Washington, or uh, West Virginia. David Hoyt has done all the NMR on this, and he and I have a, um, our co-PIs on a grant to EMSL, 
And so that has really been instrumental in helping us identify, hopefully in future NMR studies that just got sent in, the input methylamines and the conversions of those methylamines through time so we have a better understanding of how um, these compounds are being transformed in this ecosystem. The research that I talked about today has been driven by members of Mike's and my lab. Um, and so Rebecca Daly is a staff scientist in my lab and has really been instrumental in driving almost all of this research. She's really taken the charge on the viruses as well as a lot of the binning. Rich Wolf is the bioinformatician and processes all the data and makes it possible. And Dan Marcus is a grad student who started last fall and is really taking um, the methylamine story and kind of running with it. And then we collaborated with Mike and Mike and Mike's lab. I know it's confusing. Um, and on the viral project, he and Rebecca are working together on that project. So I'd like to thank the funding sources. Again, this is a Dimensions grant from NSF. Um, all of the sequencing was paid for by small PI grants from the Deep Carbon Observatory both to Paula and to myself, and it's been instrumental as a new assistant professor in having these kind of this, uh, these funding to get us off the ground and to generate hypotheses in a new ecosystem. And then Mike, Paula, and I, I lead a EMSL GGI grant where we're getting sequencing of the new systems as well as the shale systems coming down the line in August. Um, I'd like to thank my lab. Already those mentioned are in bold. And then I'd also like to thank Sue Welch, Dr. Sue Welch and Dr. Julie Sheets in the Dave Cole lab um, because they really kind of run the project and keep it going. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Kelly. That was awesome. Um, so we have some people in uh, the Hangout that have asked some questions already. I can just read them off to you before we unmute everyone. And if you came in over Twitter, actually, actually I'll start with the Twitter ones because it works on the methods. On Twitter, you know I suck at Twitter. <laughs> so, well, so one of the Twitter questions was asking about your assembly. Are you IDBA UDing this, or are you doing some other magic? Um, we played with a lot of different methods, actually, um, and we keep coming back to IDBA UD. Um, what we're really doing now is kind of targeted assemblies for some of these strains that are the HAL anaerobium in particular, um, and so we're playing with ways on, on how we pull out those kind of reads and then try to reassemble them. And so there's been a lot of genome jockeying uh, going on with that assembly to really target, but the the first to note the kind of the raw data that I showed you today is all IDBA UD. Yeah. Uh, so Brett was asking. He's he sees a lot of the same lineages in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Okay. So have you looked into petroleum hydrocarbon degradation in any of these streams? Yes, yeah, so we have. Um, and so we see that the actually the abundance of hydrocarbon degradation is actually in the earlier time points, and we. We thought we would see a lot more anaerobic, again, anaerobic being fairly poorly characterized. Um, and so we don't see a whole lot of evidence for that at the later time points, but the earlier time points we do. Um, I don't think that, I think that it just means that we don't have good hits or good, good understanding of, of those genes uh, in that process. So Paula Mauser on the project is really focused on the hydrocarbons, and so she's doing enrichments and looking at degradation and degradation networks. And so I, th I think this is a really a case where the physiology from the lab work will kind of inspire um, the biochemistry and inspire the, the genomics. And so having kind of both tracks is really important in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, another question just came over Twitter. Is your crash in OD600 corrobor corroborated by a change in cell numbers, or is it changes in shape or PHB granule abundances? So we, no, we did, we did ground truth that with protein as well as with cell counts. And it looks to be cell counts. I didn't actually believe it. That, that's done three times, because I did not believe that those numbers were, were true. And I've never had the luxury of running ODs, because I've always worked with iron minerals. Um, and so I, we did go in ground truth. And it looks to be um, real. Interestingly, we don't see that crash when we grow that same organism on um, less rich media. And so we think it's basically nutrient limitation, potentially, um, and the production and the pH drop that may be triggering um, the induction, but that's just a hypothesis right now. We're hoping to get some cryo EM images to confirm that we're actually seeing viruses in the system, and then we can move forward with some more better studies. Um, and then Jeff, if you want to unmute, it's up to you. But Jeff was right, right, you know, if Merinobacter have viruses, does it speak to how native they may be? Um, the crash of Hala anaerobium is exacerbated by not plotting on a semi-log scale. Um, <laughs> I should, I should, I knew that was going to be coming. <laughs> <laughs> I I count on him. Um, yeah, I, I will. 
<laughs> okay, wait. The first question, ignoring the the, the non semi log scale. Uh, what was the first question again? Um, well, so, so then, well, just to finish what he wrote. So he said, "There's lots of methanoloba sequences in Sudan iron mine and Merinobacter. No fracking needed." Um, and I should mention, you know, we see Merinobacter as sort of a long-lived species. Absolutely. No, I think that I think what these are, these are really high carbon salt adapted organisms. I mean, and I think that that is the salinity in the system is their low abundance in input materials and in many different ecosystems. And then in this system, this, the conditions become ripe. Um, and so we see them enriched. And it's absolutely consistent with other, other ecosystems. And I mean, I was actually really surprised when we got these back how cosmopolitan all these strains were. I was kind of expecting, you know, from other work in the subsurface that I had done to see a lot more, a lot more novel, phylogenetically novel organisms. Um, and so really what became interesting now is this kind of this linkage to viruses and the, the maybe the ecosystem kind of methylamine story. But these organisms are, are quite abundant in different ecosystems. Um, and so, and the viruses, to allude, to kind of get to where Jeff was going maybe, um, we weren't sure on the input material whether these were native or coming in on the inputs, because the 16S wasn't as tight as I wanted it to be. Um, but it's the viruses look just like the, su the surface strains. Um, and so that really, that really kind of suggested to us that these were actually coming in um, on the, in the surface. And maybe that, that was being induced as the system became more stressful and the resources became limited. But that's a total hypothesis slash speculation. All right. Well, any other questions, come in over Twitter or in the chat window or anyone log in and speak if you'd like to. Um, and I should say thank you for an awesome seminar. And um, sorry to anyone who thought this was about petroleum engineering. Apparently, <laughs> I got you. We're working on your Google Hangout and people log in going, what? So. Uh, with that, I think we will log off if no more questions come in, and uh, we will thank Kelly again for a lovely talk. And we will see you guys in a month with, I think, uh, Paul Carini will be going next. Great. Thanks, Jen. Bye, everyone. Bye.